couple minutes after the top of the hour. So we'll get started with, with our, our official program here. I want to welcome everybody to GenSpec's Fall Expert Series, exploring the complexities of how best to support gender questioning students and young people. My name is Candace Jackson. I'm an attorney in the United States and a regional coordinator for GenSpec. And today's expert discussion focuses on the intersections of autism and gender identity issues. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Susan Bradley, a Canadian psychiatrist uh, who chaired the DSM-4 subcommittee on gender disorders. Dr. Bradley served as the head of the Division of Child Psychiatry and was psychiatrist-in-chief at the Hospital for Sick Children, a major teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Toronto, where she's also a professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Bradley also founded the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry. Over the course of her career, she's seen over 400 cases of children and adolescents with gender identity disorder and related issues, and has published over 50 articles in peer-reviewed journals. I want to start our discussion today by turning things over to Dr. Bradley for remarks, and then we'd like to have a robust question and answer session. Uh, we have some participant questions that have already come in, uh, but if you'd like to ask a question, please just use the Q&A button on Zoom, not, not the chat function, but the Q&A button at any time during our discussion, and we'll try to get to all of, all of your questions that come in today. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Susan Bradley. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm always pleased to have a chance to talk about this issue, which is very clear, uh, warmed my heart. I have to start, though, by apologizing that I have gastroesophageal reflex syndrome, and uh, I lose my voice if I don't chew gum when I'm trying to talk, so I apologize. Um, uh, the uh, I was explaining earlier to Candace uh, how this field has changed, uh, and partially it's changed because in the last 20 years, uh, we have experienced this phenomena called ROGID, which I, I'm sure you all understand, um, which has really shifted things in terms of the number of kids who have considered that they are trans and are being referred to our clinics. But not only has that changed, the way of trying to respond to them, I'm sure most of you are very aware of, which is the affirmative model has meant that there is relatively little um, assessment really uh, of the way these uh, youngsters think and feel before they are capable of making a decision, at least in the US, no longer in the UK, uh, in Canada, somewhere in between. But, but before they are able to uh, decide that they're going to be on puberty blockers and eventually uh, same sex or opposite sex hormones and even operations. Um, so the, the speed that that has happened has left us all, I think those of us who started out in this work who were fairly uh, cautious about all of this, uh, we weren't sure that we always knew what we were dealing with. <laughs> I can tell you that in the early days, the only other label that I used to apply to these kids, even when they were young, when you're not supposed to apply labels like this, but it was borderline personality disorder. And it took uh, almost until I left the clinic about 10 or 15 years ago that I began to be aware that that was high functioning autism that we were talking about. But, and that didn't happen for me uh, until I left the academic session uh, situation and started working uh, as a consultant to children's mental health centers uh, around here. And in those settings, I was dealing with well-trained um, social workers, psychologists, and uh, youth, child and youth workers, all of whom had been trained in CBT and the usual techniques that are uh, useful. And these kids were being sent to me because these techniques weren't working. 
And this really um, made me wake up to the realization that this was uh, a population of kids that we had probably missed by calling them borderline personality disorder. And um, I also began to take a real interest in, in that at this time and realized that many of my colleagues have not been comfortable making the diagnosis on higher functioning children for a variety of reasons. I mean, just the notion of giving anybody a psychiatric diagnosis is something that many people recoil from. And so uh, if children seem to be functioning, they obviously would not get a diagnosis. Um, and many of the higher functioning kids, especially the girls, and I'll, I'll explain about the boys in a minute, um, oftentimes the girls had a, enough social understanding to hang in on the fringes of their groups. Uh, they, they, they never were fully accepted and they nearly always felt that something was wrong with them, but they couldn't label it. That was how it all came across as they approached puberty. The boys sometimes um, had some more overt um, signs and uh, more overt difficulties and could get um, sort of left out even earlier, but the kids who had good sports talents or something like that oftentimes could find a group of kids that accepted them because they were good at that. And so uh, going back, um, the, the, the history, the presentation of these young people was much different from those who were overtly autistic, which is the group that we had always studied and thought we knew a lot about. But more recently, what has been happening is that there have been a lot of brain studies, brain function studies, looking at schizophrenia, bipolar illness, ADHD, and autism spectrum disorder. And what is emerging from that is that the, the abnormalities in the brains of that group of people are more similar than different. The, there's a gradient here. You, uh, you can imagine that some of the areas that are highly disturbed in schizophrenia are less disturbed in the ASD population, but there's still weaknesses, if, if you want to think of that, in that same population. So they would have a, a curve that's slightly lower, whereas the others would have a curve that's slightly higher. And what is really important is that when you do family histories, oftentimes when you're looking at kids in the autism spectrum, you will find a family history of somebody who's had a psychotic illness. Nearly all of the kids in uh, the ASD group have symptoms of ADHD, but not all ADHD kids have symptoms of ASD. <laughs> so th there's sort of lumps and, and uh, valleys here. But the, the other thing is that uh, there's a very good researcher um, who worked on a long-term study of kids in, in Australia. And he looked at uh, people, uh, really a, a large population of people and followed them up to, I think it was mid twenties roughly. And he was able to do brain studies on a lot of these people over time. And so he has come out and said that there is, when somebody has some kind of psychiatric illness, there is one factor which he has given the name a P factor. Those of you who have talked uh, about kids in education and things will know that we have a, a, a factor which assesses IQ. And he's saying this is the same kind of thing, but it's, it's the person's ability to manage their emotions, which is absolutely critical. And what has happened as well is that there was work uh, at several different levels now where uh, people have looked at, at the borderline personality population and said, 
they look much more like the high functioning autism population than they do like anybody else. And they are, uh, one would have to guess, um, really right in there somewhere in, in all of what I'm describing and not, not honestly separate from uh, any of this. And we've known that they have real trouble with emotion regulation and uh, the kids in the high functioning autism spectrum, that's one of the keynote factors that uh, life is difficult for them because they, they have problems when they get dysregulated, getting re-regulated. My grandson uh, has this and he has real meltdowns at times over absolutely minor kinds of things that happen. And it's extremely difficult for my daughter, who's the main parent, to try to help him get back to normal. If any of you have experienced anything like that, you'll understand how, how long that process stays in your head. You don't just let go of it. And uh, Steve Porges, uh, a psychologist, um, I, I can't remember wh wh where he was affiliated, but a number of years ago wrote a book about uh, vagal nerve function and arguing that the vagal nerve is the key um, part of our brain system, our nervous system for re-regulating us. There's a sympathetic system which makes us want to do fight or flight and there's a parasympathetic system that wants helps us calm down and that parasympathetic system regulates our hearts our lungs um, all of those systems that have to stay working properly for a, a person to to function well and he studied kids in the autism spectrum and their vagal nerve function that parasympathetic part is not working very well. So he's made reference to the fact that they're in a state of fight or flight way too long for it to be good for them. Uh, and that was really helpful to me as I was sort of trying to get my head around all of this. And a woman named Holly Bridges uh, in, the, in Australia wrote a, a fairly interesting book about 10 years ago it didn't get a great deal of play except amongst some people who knew about Steve Porges, I think. But she argued that unless you help these individuals learn to regulate their feelings, you can't really make any progress. And this gets back to the, the, the skilled clinicians that I was dealing with who were saying, <laughs> I can't work with this person. And part of the problem was that we, we didn't really know how to help them regulate their feelings well. We're learning, but there's a lot we haven't learned. And, you know, in the past, we've used large doses of psychotropics, uh, antipsychotic things and all of this for kids who get really way out of it. And, and most of those have horrible side effects. So it's not ideal to have only one strategy for trying to help kids learn to regulate themselves. A part of the, the, the complexity in all of this is that until we get enough agreement about what, how widely distributed some of these characteristics are in the population, it's very hard to get good research done. Uh, the, there was a study a number of years ago done uh, on patient, patients who failed three trials of medication for their um, depression. And they implanted a device right on the breastbone. It's called a vagal nerve stimulator. And those people had a recovery, uh, actually a cure rate, not, not a recovery rate, and there's a difference in that. A cure rate is really good. We very seldom get cure rates in, in psychiatry. It was up around um, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, which has never been heard of. That, that's what's amazing about some of this stuff. We, most people don't want to have some kind of device implanted under their skin, and it's costly and can cause infections. So 
people have been looking at other ways of doing vagal nerve stimulation as one of the ways of trying to get people so that they can calm enough to manage themselves when this dysregulation starts. Uh, there's a device available in England and I've been getting a lot of people to try to use it. Uh, generally people who use it say that, that it really does help, but, but that's not a scientific study. <laughs> uh, and that's where we've got to get more information about that part of brain function. But, you know, we know in the autistic population that there's problems with the gut, uh, there's problems with the immune system, and all of these things are related to the autonomic nervous system. So I think we have knowledge now about some of the things that we could start working on more uh, vigorously. Uh, we've just got to do it. Uh, and in the meantime, <laughs> these kids are getting into all kinds of difficulties. Uh, you're all familiar with the trans issue and how many kids who seem to be vulnerable in different ways, uh, these uh, high functioning autistic kids coming into puberty tend to feel extremely left out and they don't know how to navigate that whole psychosocial, psychosexual kind of thing. Um, they do not understand what's wrong with them. Uh, they don't understand their difficulty in social interaction and they keep trying, but the failures are, are such that they're often simply left out or rejected. And that's horrible for their self-esteem. These kids, unless they've got something that they're really good at, often feel that they're just losers. And, you know, very few of them are losers, but they end up feeling that way. Um, so it, it's a dilemma at the moment for how do we help them manage this transition to adulthood? Um, and nobody has, quotes the answers. And, and that's a great long uh, thing to say, I can't answer some of your questions because <laughs> we don't have enough of the kind of uh, studies that really have tried out various kinds of things. Uh, the, I, I've mentioned the fact that we're starting to look at, at connections between a lot of these different disorders. And as we do that, uh, people are beginning, I think, to try different things. But for the population of kids who tend to get into difficulties around their gender, the other things that they're also very vulnerable to are anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thinking. That's a very high index. And even after they've gone through transition uh, and, and in the boys there, if you look at some of the, the individuals who've been involved in the school shootings and things like that, whether you, actually can see that they've had a diagnosis or not. Many of them were loners and they felt left out. Here in Toronto, we had a, a man who took a van and, and ran down our main street and killed a whole bunch of women. And uh, he was later, uh, he, he acknowledged that he was uh, a, um, oh, this is my trouble with, with words. He feels that women will have nothing, nothing to do with this group of men. I can't remember. Somebody else will know the name. But he was clearly in the spectrum. And I've been taking an interest in the histories of a lot of these where I can get the information. And I'm convinced that a lot of these men were vulnerable because what they tend to do, the boys more than the girls, is they become venge vengeful. They, they feel that they have a right to seek vengeance. And even many of them at a risk to their own lives because a lot of them get killed or kill themselves. So there are these populations of kids who have graduated into being adults who are really struggling. Um, another friend of mine, she's a colleague who, whose son is in the spectrum, has written a book about here in Canada, 
our services that help these kids transition into uh, adult life are, are really inadequate. And so many of them, they may get through school, but they don't have a whole lot of support and then they're trying beyond that. So it's, it, it's a hard slog and it's a hard slog for parents. The ones who get pulled into the uh, trans, trans um, identification, in my mind at least, get a sense that these people accept me. They know who I am. And they've labeled me as trans, trans and, and that must be what I am. But it makes me feel I've at least been accepted. And it's, that's the, the, in adolescence, one of the key things, as most of you will remember, is that people want, uh, they want friends who accept them. They want, uh, 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 I'm going to use the word marital, uh, partners um, who love them and think they're great. Many of these kids will identify as um, homosexual and lesbian or uh, gay or um, in between. Uh, but there is still enough uh, difficulty accepting the LGBTQ uh, community that, that it's also not exactly okay. So even though they may find a partner and feel better, they may still struggle with whether, you know, we're just as good as anybody else. Uh, and I, I have a story that I'll tell, it's brief. Um, we were following a, a young man. He, he came to us when he was nine or 10 from one of the agencies that I later um, consulted with, but he came because he's had a very conflicted and difficult early childhood. He'd been in care for a number of years. And he was like nearly all of the kids that we were seeing at that time, he was pretty convinced that he should be a girl. And uh, we, we had a pattern of, of providing a, a reasonable amount of therapy to everybody. And he was getting some in the uh, agency and, and we would keep a track on how he was doing. And we thought he was going on to transition. We were quite, quite convinced. Uh, we saw him over about five or six years. And I was consulting to the same agency, so I would bump into him every once in a while. And one day when I came in the door, uh, he was coming out the door and I thought, God, he looks good. And I said, Frankie, you look just great. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not trans anymore, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> he was in an LGBT group and he'd met another boy and they fell in love and that solved his problem. And, you know, I, we all sort of poo poo the idea of how <laughs> sort of falling in love is something that, you know, isn't that important, but it really is important. And it's important for people to be accepted uh, by somebody who loves them. And parental love isn't quite the same <laughs> as falling in love with a peer. So I'm becoming an advocate of uh, alternate kinds of experience for many of these kids. And the groups provide one access to other people and opportunities to talk about yourself because there's trans kids there, there's gay and lesbian kids. You don't have to be anything, uh, but you, you talk about it. And uh, some of that talking can be helpful. Uh, and the other sort of thing that I'm also advocating for, uh, and this comes from, uh, I had a colleague whose daughter was clearly in the spectrum and, but never diagnosed, but she was gifted and she was in classes for gifted throughout her school career. And I saw her uh, shortly after I left that agency and said, you know, how's your daughter doing? She said, well, She's still got issues. She's going to university next year. And, but, you know, she still calls me when she gets home from school to say, what can I eat? And uh, she, mom knew clearly, you know, what her difficulties were. But the parents of that group of kids had formed 
a protective coating, if you want to call it that. The kids, I suspect a lot of the other kids were in the same boat and they liked each other and they, they were their friends. So having a friend who loves you and likes you <laughs> is really important for most teens. And if we can do anything about the opportunities for them, that can make a difference. So I'm going to stop talking and entertain some of your questions and I hope I've left some time. Ugh. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you so much. Um, I've, I've, I've got a start off question first and then I'll, I'll move on to, to our audience questions. Um, so broad, broadly speaking, it, it seems like data is showing that, that youth with ASD, whether diagnosed or not, are are overrepresented right now in, in the cohort presenting at gender clinics. Yep. Are, there, are there characteristics then of autism or, or autism spectrum disorder that lend themselves to feeling gender dysphoric or believing that, that they were born in the wrong body and, and feeling a need, a need to transition? Is there a, a, a connection there? Well, the, the only answer to that uh, that I can think of is that we would see kids uh, when they were even much younger who were convinced they were dogs and cats and a variety of other things. And one of the other participants had raised the issue about dissociative disorders. And they do. They have dissociative kinds of episodes. And I think that makes it easier for them to think, you know, I really am something, I, there's, I'm really something different than I think I am. A lot of the kids uh, had other body dysmorphic disorders too. So these are, you know, part and parcel of the same thing, looking at something and thinking that's the answer. My nose is too big. <laughs> you know, is that part of, is that part of trying to solve the, the question or, or the issue of why, why do I not feel like I fit in? Why do I feel like I am different from my peers? That's it, that's it. Because they, they, they don't get the, the social connection about one of the people who submitted a question said, my daughter is going into puberty and her interests are still very immature. She's still into anime and drawing uh, cartoons or something or other like that. And that is quite typical. So that when they start to interact with that more, more mature peer group, the mature, mature peer, peer group doesn't know, know what to do with them. But they don't understand that it's, that's the thing that's making them uh, rejected or, or you know, mm -hmm. left. So We've that's what they're trying to solve by, by becoming trans. Uh, and and the, when when they think they are, and they join somebody on the internet who's from the trans uh, advocacy group, who says, "Well, if you think you are, you must be." That's it, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> it's all done. And their form, their kind of thinking, the rigidity that once they think they have an answer, they they get locked onto it, it, it and it's often very hard to unlock that. Uh, so. There's a combination of those kinds of thinking styles, but it, the, the fundamental thing is the emotional thing that leads to trying to figure that all out in my mind. Well, that, that, lead, that leads nicely into two different uh, audience questions. Uh, one is, are, to, to your awareness, is there a, a protocol going on for differential diagnosis for ASD and gender dysphoria? For example, is that is that a standardized protocol going on right now? No, no. I, I, you know, unless I'm just not informed. But we we have been slow to get our heads around this whole thing, mm -hmm. and even the psychiatric nomenclature. What what they did uh, a number of years ago it was uh, the early twenty. Uh, I can't remember, but they. Uh, enabled us to use the, the term autism spectrum. So that meant, have you got a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that? And, mm -hmm. and you know, that's how it's done now. Uh, but many people don't, don't do that systematically. Mm -hmm. And then you, you had mentioned um, 
rigid thinking and kind of latching on to a solution, is there is there any reason to think one way or the other that 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 pattern of thinking means that a young person with ASD who does pursue medical gender transition would have a, a high any higher risk of later regretting it? Well, I don't know whether it it's a higher risk of uh, preventing it. It may mean that they will feel they have to carry through with it and only realize much later that they made a mistake. So it's it's sort of you know this solution. He said that's what I am, or I think that must be the way. So I found my solution. Mm -hmm. And you know when when the UK uh, court said that these children are too young to be making this decision on their own. They should be at least 16 or 18 for these kinds of irreversible procedures. They, they were absolutely right because a, a young person at age 14 who's distressed and thinks there's something wrong with them cannot think clearly <laughs> and balance all of the different things that we might be trying to help them understand they've got this in their head. <laughs> this is the answer, so get out of my way. <laughs> well, you, you, had, you had mentioned, um, you know, that, that maybe, maybe a, a lot of parents of, of children with ASD uh, protectively bubble them and, and, and work out things that, you know, are protective of their kids. So when they grow up and they, they go away to college for the first time, let's say, what are some of the the, the things that a mental health professional or counselor in a college environment could help a young person with who is at that age 18 uh, phase where mom and dad aren't there to help anymore, you know, to do that daily routine for them anymore. And they're, they're on their own for the first time and they're, you know, coming in and, and having questions about gender and, and probably adjusting to life on their own in general? You know, it's a very difficult time. And as far as I know, uh, we haven't really trained enough mental health professionals who work in colleges or, you know, even in our hospitals and other places to look out for this population of, of kids. Um, we are, we're getting better at it. We're, you know, labeling that this is a, a scary time. But any of these transition points, I mentioned from elementary to high school, and that's puberty and all that entails. But the college thing is equally difficult for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, if they find, and the, the advantage to university at, at some level is that they may find a few more kids who are like them, who share some of the same interests, who are really into tech stuff, or really into different things. And finding that kind of connection can go a long way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because the other person will value them for what they know or what they can do. Um, but, th but the mental health <laughs> end of it, <laughs> that doesn't really get taken care of, I'm afraid. I don't think it does. Yeah. The, the, this is a, an, an interesting question. Is there, is there validity to a belief that um, for, for a, a young person with autism, but also with gender dysphoria, thinking along the lines of, well, my, my autism can't be cured, but my dysphoria can through transition. So at least I can, I can help myself out in, in that way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go that route. How do, how, how do you respond, respond to that? You know, to the extent that we have a few longer term studies of the health of people who've transitioned, they continue to experience quite significant mental health difficulties. Um, I have followed now a person whom I saw when I was just in the middle of my psychiatric training. This was at that point a young woman and uh, she um, had a girlfriend, but the girlfriend had been in relationships with a couple of guys and eventually had uh, kids from those. 
she continued to, I think, find that this girlfriend was her main support. She transitioned and went through the whole process uh, and was convincingly male and worked in a male thing and looked after this whole family of her girlfriend at that time, they actually married, and her two kids. Uh, and and really did very very well. The I I would see her, him. Sorry. Um, oh, we, we still correspond on email, but but regularly. He's in his early seventies. I'm in my early eighties, <laughs> and he um, is he, he only went for a a phallus uh, a, a, a replacement after his wife died. And so, to me, that's illustrative of the fact <laughs> really provided the care and the sense of belonging that he needed. And so he started all over again after she died uh, to search out something that was going to be more secure for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's still really functioning very well despite all of this. And uh, but, you know, these are uh, things that the depression doesn't go away. <laughs> it, it may go up and down. And if you're in a good relationship, it's probably not going to be, be too bad. From a, a counselor's point of view, um, working with young people, say college, college age, is it is it your experience, your view that for the population of, of youth with autism or, or, or ASD, um, that ex exploratory therapy as opposed to immediate and, and, and sole affirmation of gender approach in therapy, that, that the exploratory approach is, is particularly more important or more or more helpful it's it's very very important because um many um young people have not had any opportunity to reflect on this whole issue when they're in a, an affirmative approach system and they they really do get shuffled along for the most part as opposed to given many opportunities to rethink it. Uh, I would like to see all of them have opportunities to talk to people who've transitioned. Uh, maybe other people who are gay and lesbian who may have had similar thoughts but have resolved it in a different kind of way. This whole process of growing up and who you're going to be um, is malleable <laughs> and it doesn't have to be this one thing but they've locked onto it and it is so um i don't want to say it's harmful but you know a lot of the i used to have meetings regularly with the people who ran the adult gender identity clinic and they um they said you know even though they're happier or at least say they're happier they're, st they're constantly having to have this surgery or that surgery. It's, it's never enough and it's never perfect. And so your life then gets focused on your body and mm -hmm. whether your body's okay, rather than on your relationships <laughs> and everything else you, you, know, you should be looking at and thinking about it. So it isn't, one of the things that's happened in the past is everybody gets scared when they realize that these kids are suicidal and, and we've had kids commit suicide. So it, it's not just a joke, but they continue to have a lot of suicidal thinking even after they transition. And that's where a lot of the, the, the detransitioners can be helpful in terms of answering questions about that kind of thing. So, you know, what's different now and why is it different? Uh, so, uh, I think that the therapy end of it is, is critical until they're at an age where they fully understand what they're getting into and can make a, an informed decision and, and know that, you know, this is not going to necessarily be an easy life. 
Yeah. Uh, one one participant um, asks if you have any suggestions um, for how to how to work with young people in an exploratory way in an environment where affirmation only is, is, is being expected, pushed. It's an awful bind, I tell you. I mean, the, the whole wokeness in our culture means that we are shut up in many different ways that are inappropriate. And uh, I mean, our, our clinic got shut down for those very reasons various reasons and it was one of the best clinics in the world and, and the hospital just cut us off and uh, so um, you you don't know what's going to happen if you start doing something that you know they and you know they've been slapping all kinds of hands in academia of people who who don't toe the line so there's no easy solution I, I think it they have to have a frank discussion with the parents and with the, the subject about their concern and about how they may have they may have very little license to do what they feel they need to be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have to decide whether that person is the best person to do it or whether there's anybody else who's you know not not so constrained. Uh, yeah. What, what is your perspective on um, ROGD, rapid onset gender dysphoria, as a, a, a cohort and identified um, and, and labeled that way in, in um, yeah, at least you know, some research, other researchers take issue with it, but, but whatever the label, are, have you seen throughout, throughout your career um, a difference in, in the, the population of youth presenting with gender issues? Absolutely. Um, we, when we started, saw mainly little kids. Uh, and then gradually we began seeing more uh, teenagers, but not the stream that we are now seeing. And the more I hear from kids and families about the environment in their schools and the fact that that their child may have been just one of several kids in a classroom who decided they were trans. I mean, this speaks to um, some kind of contagion. <laughs> I use the word cults, and I guess that's because uh, as I was growing up and uh, learning to be a psychiatrist, there were some very significant cults which did real harm to families and people. And this has much the same flavor, but it's toned down and it's been made socially acceptable. Uh, but it's still, you know, the, the kids are often told you, you, you shouldn't speak to your parents because they're wrong. And, you know, stuff like that, which is cutting them off from people who are helpful to them. Uh, so it, it's... Um, it is a, a form, I, I, I can think of no other word than something that smacks of being a cult uh, that's been um, given sanctity <laughs> by the way we operate. For, um, with, with, with respect to young adults um, with ASD, do you think that parental involvement in that age 18 to 22 college years phase is, uh, is, does that look different or should that look different when your young adult child has ASD ver ver versus not? Is it more beneficial for parents to stay extra involved or, or not? No, uh, I, uh, knowing several parents of, of children of this age, I think it's really hard not to stay involved because these kids need more guidance and care and, and support. And it, it gets really hard to know how to make that work um, because many of the kids end up not wanting, wanting you to be involved, but at the same time, they can't do without you. It's that push-pull kind of thing. Uh, 
and parents often see that they're getting themselves into situations which are not going to be healthy for them and but trying to get them out of it is another thing entirely the, this is where at some level peer support groups become important and this is why i'm i go back to lgbt groups and other things like that i, I have lgbt friends and uh, one of them at one point pointed out to me that the the LGBT community feels they've lost many of their LGBT persons. There are hardly any more uh, butch females. Um, and to some extent, it's true of, of the males as well. And they know that these people would have been part of that community and, and fared reasonably. Um, but they don't have much of a voice to, to talk about that thing. Whereas if they're, if they're, you know, part of a group and their job is to try to support people, they may have more influence on some of the kids or people at that age than parents do. Are those, are those kinds of peer support groups something then that colleges and universities could productively do to, to help uh, to help youth, uh, you know, with with and without ASD, maybe. I, I think so. I think uh, you know, I I've been quite convinced that the one agency that I worked at here in uh, in Orangeville, uh, they have had LGBTQ groups for quite some time, and everybody seems really quite pleased <laughs> about it. And and I've seen a number of the kids who've gone through, you know, and come back and so on. How do you resolve the tension, though, between uh, uh, anecdotal, anecdotally, I, I, ha I have heard from recent college students uh, things like, well, I tried going to my my college's LGBTQ group yeah. be because I because I'm homosexual. And when I got there, I got a lot, a lot of <laughs> pressure to just be trans, be trans. <laughs> just be supported oh, in being well, homosexual. Well, you know, that's that's the irony, isn't it? I don't yeah. know. I don't know the answer to that, but it's a real thing. <laughs> so maybe, maybe subgroups of, of LGBTQ support groups are yeah something would be can. helpful. <laughs> yeah. Are you seeing a difference in breakdown by sex in in the experience of ASD young people who also? have uh, gender issues, different experiences between uh, male and female? Um, not really, no. And, and this is where I don't think we have enough of a population to have studied something like mm. that, clearly. Uh, similar question that a participant has, um, uh, it, have you have you seen evidence of, or do you do you have a reason to think that there is a, a breakdown where of the of the youth presenting at gender clinics who are also ASD more of that group are male than female? No, oh, in fact, it was the other way around for a long time. I think it's shifting a bit, but not. Uh -huh. Do you view di diagnoses of ASD and gender dysphoria as uh, separate diagnoses, but often interrelated? How, how would you describe any kind of crossover or, or relationship between those those two diagnoses? Well, the um, the ASD diagnosis is primary in that a child is born with that um, structure to their brain and the genetic and otherwise background that uh, we know is part of it. Um, all of these other things are, in fact, secondary. Um, they, uh, there are many ASD high-functioning people who don't have gender issues. Uh, I can't tell you exactly why they don't have them, and others do, except that some of the factors that I've been talking about 
may have been more available to them. Uh, you know, the getting into some kind of area of interest. Uh, a lot of these kids get into tech things, the boys. And, uh, you know, we know that a lot of the techies are a bit weird, a bit quirky, all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, they don't have disorders. They're, they're pretty smart, productive people. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have to recognize that these are things that can happen to all of us, but are more likely to happen to this group because mm -hmm. of the vulnerability. And the other thing, and you, you were, you're having somebody to, to speak with you about trauma in a bit, but these people are very vulnerable to trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, part of this is that if that vagal nerve system isn't working properly from birth, and there's some evidence that that's so, um, it's going to be much, much harder for them to re-regulate if they've lost a parent or the parents are separated or somebody's treated them badly. And they may also not have as much insight into their own behavior and a way of talking about or understanding their, their thinking, which is what we call cognitive stuff, to say, well, if I didn't think this way, Maybe I wouldn't feel so badly, but that's a harder thing for them to enact. And so the um, many of the things we know, we, we actually have some studies on this, that kids in the spectrum who've also had um, adverse early childhood experiences really are in worse situations than others. And then, you know, getting back to your original issue, are these different things, but they're just more vulnerable to a whole host of things happening after that. You, uh, you, you mentioned um, dissociative disorders a little bit, um, but could you expand on that a little bit? Is that a, a common comorbidity with, with ASD? Um, and then does it factor in in a different way when there's ASD and gender identity issues involved? You know, I, I honestly don't think I'm the best person to answer that, yeah. but I don't. I, I would say that it's relatively uncommon, except in the little kids, where <clears throat> their capacity to test reality is mm -hmm. less good. Um, but you... Uh, you would need a, a fairly large population who have different kinds of things, in fact, to answer that adequately. And we haven't got that. Um, generally for young people with ASD, have you, have you seen that there is any kind of benefit to sending them off to college uh, a little bit later, like having a, a couple of gap years or, so, or, or something like that? Do they tend to fare better with a little bit of extra time in the nest, anything, anything along those lines? You know, uh, that's, uh, that, that I think is something that a lot of parents and kids wonder about a little bit because they, they do get fairly anxious about the idea of going off. As far as I know, we don't have evidence to support one, one or the other. And an awful lot depends on the school they're going to, the supports they're gonna have there, um, you know, with some of the things that are happening in colleges nowadays, it sounds as though a lot of kids going are not that well supported. Uh, I know very little about the US college system, but uh, these kids need to get hooked into something that is supportive in some way or another. Mm -hmm. I think you, you, would ref, you would refer to, at least in some point in time, um, girls in particular being missed as far as di diagnosis for, for ASD is, ha has that gap been closed quite a bit? Is it still an issue? You know, I think it's still an issue because uh, there are quite a number of women who are writing books uh, about deciding that that's who they really were. And uh, it's only after their own reflection and, and time that it's become pretty obvious to them because mm -hmm. uh, they have been able to manage it. I've talked to therapists and people like that who are saying, you know, that's me. <laughs> I 
and I agreed that's them. <laughs> but you know they they succeeded, and uh, so uh, it's it's very hard to um, get one's head around all of that. And I mean I don't know um, uh, what the answers to to all of that are. What it does it it's it seems that in uh, places where at least data can be looked at that um, a higher a higher percentage of girls than boys um, are, are now presenting to gender clinics. Do you think then that a reasonable hypothesis might would be that at least some significant percentage of those girls at gender clinics are undiagnosed ASD also? Yes, I do. Yeah. You know, the girls, uh, lots of them, they can, they can mimic, they can do things that allow them to hang in and they'll, they'll often say, well, I was kind of on the fringe and, you know, they were allowed to sort of be a part of it, but, but they were often taken advantage of too in that, you know, people would say nasty things to them and, and they didn't always know how to react to that. And it, I, I think that's, the, the thing that allows them to not, we don't go around looking for that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's, so some kids don't make them so like it's, it's just not seen all of the time, unless parents start to be really aware that they're having trouble. And then not even all therapists quite know what to make of it. Um, they maybe blame it on the school or the peer group or this, that, or the other thing. So, you know, it's it's not easy. But some of the, the books that are being written now by uh, adult women, Jennifer Cook O'Toole is one of them. And uh, oh, there have been another a number of them really talk to their experience um, growing up. <laughs> and it, yeah. it's interesting. Well, as we reach the top of the hour here, uh, any any last uh, thoughts or, or words of advice, uh, particularly for um, mental health professionals who are trying to help youth and, and college age um, young people uh, with ASD, whether diagnosed or not, uh, struggle with, with some of these gender issues? Well, you know, even though I am those <clears throat> who are not officially diagnosed, going through the inventory of the signs and, and sort of asking, well, what were you like as a kid or asking their parents who get a chance to interview them? You know, do you remember the child doing these kinds of things or was it often hard for them to understand others' reactions to their behaviors? These kids, often they would do things. I have a grandson, I think I've already mentioned. He goes around whacking his sister and he thinks it's fun. And she doesn't think it's fun at all. And so uh, asking a lot of the things, you know, was it very hard to settle down again if something, did you have a lot of things that drove you crazy when you're, the feeling of your clothes or the feeling of your socks or did you ever get into things so seriously that people thought you were going a little crazy? Like, you know, you could play video games all night long or you could do that. Like these, these are some of the kind of things that at least might give therapists a better sense of what you are dealing with it, whether you label it in that way or not, mm -hmm. and decide maybe we've got to figure out ways of getting this stress response back online. Um, this, I, I'm not advertising for anybody, but I, that's the only thing I've found. There's a device called a Sensate device that's available in England. And you wear it for 15 minutes a day. And uh, a lot of the people who've been using it have really reported that it's calm. Uh, I have many family members who've used it, and they also liked it. So, um, but it's stuff like this, finding ways of calming yourself down can be immensely helpful. Uh, and whether you got the labels right, if you, if you look at the kinds of things that they may be able to, to work on better that would enable them to function better mm -hmm. uh, really can make the difference regardless of the, the actual diagnosis. 
That is very insightful. Well, this is this has been such a, a helpful and valuable discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradley, for joining us and sharing your insights and expertise with us today. And thank you everybody for participating in today's installment of GenSpec's Fall Expert Series. And we hope to see everybody at our next installment uh, of the Fall Expert Series. And we will wrap up for now, but thank you to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.